Hello? Oh, there there we go. Great. Thanks, everyone, uh, for being here. And I'd like to thank John Favreau for joining us at XTech. Uh, we're going to take a, a sort of dive into virtual reality and the future of storytelling. But even more so, I want to use this opportunity to go deep, talk about technology and humanity, really, you know, really, you know, plug into that critical interface between the two. Uh, before we begin, I just uh, have to say I'm, I'm super honored to be up here on stage with John. Uh, despite us having overlap for two years in high school in the Bronx, um, I only got to uh, meet him and introduce to him through how many of you have when he was just so money as Mike Peters and Swingers. I'm sorry, couldn't, couldn't resist going there, uh, which you are also uh, the writer of. And I followed your career over the years, and I think the thing that blows me away the most, besides all the credits you accumulated, is the number of hats you've worn and the breadth of the stories that you've told. So being an actor, and a writer, as well as a director, as diverse films and hits from Elf, Iron Man, Iron Man 2, most recently Jungle Book, and then the producer of The Avengers and other Marvel blockbusters, and then of course The Chef, where you wear all four hats. And so before we talk about technology, just to place this in perspective of where you've come in your career, what inspires you to take on your career and, and have it from so many different directions? Well, I think what, what was interesting about what a lot of the other speakers have been saying on these various panels is we're always returning back to the idea of storytelling, what storytelling is. And storytelling is a, a, a unifying quality of all of those hats. Uh, when you're an actor, especially a character actor like I started off, you got to look at the script and understand what the scene needs, what the movie needs, because if you don't fit into the story, there's a good chance you're getting cut out. Uh, most movies are overshot, and they have a lot of footage on the floor. And if you're not part of the main storyline, and I, it's happened to me a lot of times, uh, you, you get cut out of the movie, and you start to learn a lot about storytelling because you realize when you when you make it to the premiere and when you don't get invited. Uh, so, um, so a lot of that has to do with fitting into the the path, the main the main track of of what the story is about. And, and through that, and through reading a lot of scripts from auditioning, I started writing, and then that going to directing and being on the set, because it's a wonderful position to be in as an actor, because it, it's like an apprenticeship. You get to watch the directors, you get to watch the other filmmakers. And we imprint, sometimes consciously, sometimes subconsciously, on the people that, that are around us that we're learning from uh, in, in, most, in most trades, to some extent. So. All of that was an indoctrination. And then going from there on, it really is just taking that skill set and applying it to different media. So uh, with the technology, it's just, uh, you know, especially with technology where there's so much innovation happening and people don't know exactly what to do with it yet. And that's just the nature of innovation. So let's talk about that. Let's dive into technology, which is you know the point of, of this meeting. And we're ex-tech, right? Experiential technology. And the focus is on advancing the discussion beyond tech for tech's sake, but really technology for the human experience. And you've been a pioneer in that. Um, and I would say in the most nuanced and even the most human aspect of the art of storytelling. So maybe you could just give us a little of your perspective, even a historical one, on how technology can be used as a tool for storytelling, and then your own personal journey into using technology to retell a classic story like The Jungle Book uh, in a fresh way. I think technology's always been used in storytelling, and whether it's called technology or if it's magic or if it's something uh, incredible and extraordinary that helps focus the, uh, the listener the audience of the story that focuses them on what the underlying message of the myth is. And so uh, it's, it's been done, it, even in, in, in literature, some fantastic event will happen. There's some character that will come in with, with um, superhuman abilities. Uh, Yoda was able to lift the X-wing out of the swamp. And until he does that, Luke Skywalker really doesn't care what he's talking about, right? That's, that's kind of the, the path. You have somebody who's from a generation that understands the lessons of the world. That mentor character is going to pass that information down, but the only thing that makes that next generation that holds their attention is some use of magic or extraordinary means. 
and you know that's why everybody listens to Gandalf. If he if he <laughs> wasn't a wizard, uh, he'd just be another old guy telling thing telling people what to do. <laughs> people don't care uh, if if it's not relevant to them. We're all kind of marching forward on our own path until we're shaken out of that. And the whole Joseph Campbell hero's journey thing is about it's it's about rites of passage. It's about starting off in one on one level of consciousness and then through a predictable arc end up uh, dying and transforming and becoming the next, you know, emerging as the butterfly. And so storytelling fits a, a very specific path. I first got into it because I really liked George Lucas and his movies. And then when, you know, when there's a, a, the Moyers series with Joseph Campbell at the Skywalker Ranch, the, I think it was The Power of Myth, uh, I, I paid attention because I liked Star Wars. And, and I liked Kurosawa because I liked Star Wars. And, and so I started down my path as an audience member and started to understand that everybody that I looked up to was referencing these same sets of rules and these same old myths that they're constantly retelling through different tech. And, but it was the tech that drew me in. It was the motion control models that uh, were, were just discussed previously uh, that were being done at, 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 at um, uh, Industrial Light and Magic that made me want to go see that movie. But what I didn't know was I was learning about the coming of age of a young Jedi uh, which follows, which that it was just reskinned from, you know, ancient ancient stories of, of of rites of passage, and so now with me, I go back to that source code. I go back to that initial, whether it's a the Jungian collective subconscious or just a tradition that we've inherited from each previous generation, and taking those new tools and applying them to the old stories seems to be. The magic combo that worked for Lucas, worked for Disney, worked for uh, works for um, uh, Cameron, and 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 the list goes on. And how about so the opportunity is clear? How about the the challenges of being able to tell the story in a human way and, and have that connection, and not let the technology be the dominant force? Is that something that you always struggle with in a film, or has it come naturally? How how does? No, I think it's I think as long as you prioritize things, it's just a matter of what priorities you have. Uh, you can be a geek and love tech, but but that doesn't mean that you are not connected to the human experience. I would argue that the human experience is the relevant connective point between a technology, because we're people. We're, all this is building on top of us, just like we, our brains built on top of each layer that came previous. Technology is layering on top of our prefrontal cortex, and it's, it's, it's expanding what we're able to do, but what drives us is still the same. And so I'm always looking for the opportunity when I'm telling a story to make people feel something. And by creating spectacle, that's sometimes the best way to do it. Because it makes people are impacted by, feel, by feelings. That's what makes you remember things. It's interesting because I'm working on Lion King now. I was working on Jungle Book previously. You're taking films that people have very clear memories of. And I always make sure I list everything I remember from the movies before I, I rewatch them. And it's amazing how selective your memory is. And it's usually based on things that you feel emotionally connected to. Those are the things that get the beacons in your memory. Uh, and then there's other things I, I have no memory of whatsoever. And they seem to be less relevant because they don't, f either they don't fit into the story as well or, or they don't uh, have an emotional impact that makes it kind of burn it into your, your memory. Because you're constantly editing your memory and prioritizing things. And so I, I think that's... That's kind of the key, finding the inflection point where technology uh, uh, creates an emotional response seems to be the path that, that is, is, you know, that's the, that's the path to the fire exit that you want to go down when you're, uh, when, you're, when you're trying to figure out how to carve a story out. Right. You, if you haven't seen uh, John's TED, TED talk on technology and humanity, it, it, it's amazing. We're, we're just going to touch a little bit of it in our time today. But you said something really interesting of your interactions with the team has changed. So this is a very diverse audience. We have technologists here, but we have artists and musicians and other storytellers, uh, filmmakers. But now you're interacting with so many members of the team that are part of the filmmaking process, but all using their technology technologies in a unique way. C can you speak on that? Yeah, I just borrowed the, basically the, the model that, that Walt Disney started with animation, which at the time was a high-tech, you know, a high-tech medium. Uh, it, it still feels, um, it still, uh, 
The, the model of the way you use an expensive technology in storytelling still follows that model. So if you look at what's done at Pixar, it's not that different structurally from what was done with Walt Disney because now, of course, it's render time. That's, that's your limitation. Um, that's the expensive uh, cocktail straw that everything has to pass through, right? That, that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the choke point. Um, with, back in Disney's day, it was actually painting the cells. So to cut out or to remove a scene, you know, uh, as I was saying before, scenes disappear from live action movies. There are reshoots all the time. Uh, the ratio of, of what you film to what ends up on the screen is, is minuscule. Uh, in animation, it's quite the opposite. There was a scene removed from Snow White and they still talk about it because of how wasteful it was that the, uh, the washing up scene, you could find it on, um, you could find it on online because it's so rare, everything has to be figured out and cut twi twice, uh, measured twice before it's cut once. And so as a result, what you see when you're dealing with uh, Lassiter's crew is they'll constantly pencil things over and over again, get several iterations, watch it in animatic form, and you could see it in the, in the, in the uh, additional materials. Watch The Incredibles in, in the animatic form. It's amazing how indicative it was of, of the final experience. Get all of it right before you ever go to the next step and actually render it out. And then make it as beautiful and as lifelike as you can and, and, and let it develop over the course of execution. But it's about, and I think that's why the success rate of animated films uh, as far as quality is so much higher than your, than your run of the mill live action film because so much care has gone into the storytelling and the vetting process before it ever is uh, signed off on. Whereas a lot of times with live action, you film it, you get the script ready, you film it, you see what you got, you, 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 re, you rewrite, you reshoot, you recut. It's, a, it's much more like sculpting with clay, whereas uh, animation is more like carving marble. You, you kinda, it's, it's very difficult to go backwards. And so with technology, I try to use those techniques and, and it also creates greater efficiency so that all that money goes on the screen uh, and, and it's been thought through. And so what happens is you end up in a very collaborative way. I don't just have a writer, I have a writer, a head of story, a story department of pencil artists, I have a production designer, I have keyframe illustrators. So if you came by the offices of Lion King even now, you would see the characters on the walls rendered in lifelike way, you'd see early tests, you'd see um, environments, you'd see 3D printed versions of the environments that we're creating in, 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 uh, in virtual space. Uh, we're, you know, and, and then we're trying to innovate using these technologies in the filmmaking process of using game engine technology to essentially create a multiplayer game through which you can lay out the whole movie before we ever commit to any shots. So it's seeing the opportunities in this stuff and applying the, the traditions of storytelling that interests me. How do you connect those two things so that it's not like if an old storytelling technology starts to uh, 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 diminish you don't replace it with not just a new technology, but a whole new tradition of storytelling. I'd love to see that tradition carry on uh, from film into technology as opposed to be supplanted by it. And I think that as people see that opportunity, it changes the whole, it changes the whole feeling of, of the community. Great. Well, let's uh, let's dive into virtual reality. As we know, it's a immersive technology that creates powerful experiences. It's uh, every year we 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 have this conference that gets more and more relevant. And you've taken the plunge recently into virtual reality with uh, the uh, studio Weaver in LA and Gnomes and Goblins, which just a demo aired. If you haven't seen it, I highly encourage you. It's it's amazing. And so let's talk about your inspiration into that, and then what you're trying to do with that. I so, so I'm working with a lot of the people on Jungle Book who came up because it's every it's it's everything as you all know better than I everything's overlapping now uh, the technologies are very similar there's a lot of it's the uh, I just started uh, baking sourdough bread this is like the starter phase where we're kind of colonizing uh, the starter and everything's kind of floating around and landing and growing and changing <laughs> and moving around right and it takes a certain personality to like the starter phase of it. Of course, by the time you're cutting the hot bread open, everybody's gathered around the kitchen. But only a couple geeks are in the kitchen when you're messing around with the flour and the water and, and, and the yeast. Uh, but, that's, but there are certain personality types that like that. And at this point, you could see the opportunities of what the potential is for this thing. And, and when you're dealing with a virtual reality, a lot of those people are involved with uh, motion capture. 
So a lot of the people who are working on like Avatar are now messing around with VR and because it's it's kind of this a similar a similar set of technologies because you're tracking either the camera or the subject. But there's tracking going on, and you are then interfacing in 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 real time with a uh, you know especially in room scale, you're um, tracking positioning and getting parallax and getting a full 3D experience with the rendering taking place with something that's real time. So it's a it's a game engine essentially, and so those people. There's a long answer for <laughs> such a short question. I'm sorry. Uh, the people who were working on Jungle Book were going over to Weaver, this lab in Venice, and we were in Playa Vista, to look at the new uh, HTC Vive uh, system. It was, it, was, it was a development kit at the time. And I tagged along, and I saw the blue, which was the one with the whale, which if you hadn't seen, it's, it's pretty, pretty stunning still. It's a few years old. It's still very, very stunning. And I was very... Um, uh, I had to pull the thing off, the, the HMD, because it was and so... And you're sensitive to this. I was too sensitive. I'm the type that, you know, like, don't put me in one of those zombie ones. Uh, I, would, I, I, don't, I don't even do good in horror movies or, uh, or roller coasters unless it takes me a few times or somebody tell me what's going to happen next. Uh, but but uh, I saw it, and then it really sunk in. It's the first time I felt presence. I'd never felt that phenomenon. And as a storyteller, I said, there's something here. I don't know what it's going to be used for. Everybody always asks the questions. Is it going to be at home, at the movie theater? How are you going to monetize? How does it scale? I don't know any of those answers, but I know as a storyteller, fl there were flashes of exceptional experiences that I was having uh, surrounding the phenomenon of presence that I hadn't felt in any other medium. And so I went home that night, and I, I woke up in the middle of the night, and I started scribbling down the ideas. The, the, I had some drawings of goblins that I was trying to do maybe as a stop motion project. Uh, I didn't know where it was going to go, and it all clicked to me that I could create this world where using scale and some of the available tricks, I could feel comfortable in an environment and create this curated environment where you feel connected to these characters. And so I pitched this whole you know, uh, several page vision of it to them. And uh, my animator, Andy Jones, encouraged me to come back and, and meet with Neville and the gang. And I pitched them the whole idea and they were game. And so we formed a little, a little project and I would pop by there uh, a couple times, uh, either a week or a few times a month. We assembled a team and we did this one vertical slice that you could see on, um, it, it's, uh, it's available for the, uh, if you have a room scale Vive setup, you could, you could play it for free. And uh, it went, the launch was very encouraging, and now we're doing a full build uh, where we're kind of uh, building out basically the whole thing I had pitched that, that first day. And uh, we have a great team assembled, and it's just, it's wonderful to see uh, what the best way to tell a story in VR is, because it's not like a game and it's not like a movie. It's somewhere, it's more like a Dungeons and Dragons game. Right, where you not imagine. To and you've out just, us. Right. I, I, Did you play? Past, yes, of course. We went to the we same We went to Bronx school. Science. Yeah, it yes. was a lot of, of no, we, no football team, but a play. lot of Dungeons and Dragons, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, you know, and, and uh, you describe these two pathways of VR that, uh, that you know, really spoke to you. One is the cinematic, where, you know, like the blue, where you have very little interactive control, but it's beautiful and immersive. And then the other is the extreme game, where it's all interactive. And it seems that, you know, just to, to close up this uh, story of gnomes and goblins, that you found this unique way to have a degree of interactive interactivity, but also cinema. Yeah, it was the interaction point. Again, getting back to the f very first thing you said was, what's the emotional connect? What's that connection? And we found that you know it was about the the how beautiful the the world is and what tactile. How do, how do you um, w what type of shaders do you use? What materials do you create the world in? Because you can't do it photo real like in Jungle Book because it's just too much render time. So you end up using like a claymation type surface so you could get real good. Uh, lighting and you know there's there's all sorts of things that are associated with the limitations of the technology but the thing that was the most compelling that where we really felt where we had an aha moment was when we use the HMD to allow the character to track your location and therefore your eyes and then we could create eye contact and that's when it felt different from a video game or a movie yeah. even in the even in the uh, the simple geo uh, the geometric build when you moved and he followed you with his eyes, um, something 
strange happened. Yeah. And then, then that's what we sort of built off of. Uh, I agree. That sense of connection, not just presence, but connection with something else. In this case, essentially an AI. Um, again, if you if you watch the the TED talk, you you break down that animated uh, interaction in VR, and you could see how powerful it is, even with not very high levels of of, of texture that you eventually bring in. Even there, the, yeah, the and we kept connected. it simple because it was like we would look at like um, Spirited Away or Miyazaki films, and so much was done. Or my neighbor Totoro. Those little, uh, those little dust balls that just were just a, a, a circle with eyes, and the eyes, how much character in the hands of a good animator could be brought to a simple design that works very well for, for the limitations of the game engine technology. And so having Andy Jones, who you know these animators, part you know it's, this is the other part that's human. You need humans to breathe life into these uh, into these golems, right. and and so by having the the. Anim the, the hand of the animator involved in, in making it feel right. And then, of course, the programmers building these state machines so that the behavior was um, influenced by the way you acted towards that character. All of that backstage and then the design of it and the animation on the surface, those all work together to create moments of where you could see the potential of something. And that's kind of how it works with the new technology. You're looking for flashes. You're looking for the potential in moments. That's why you do tests on film. You know, the first time I saw a Bagheera in Jungle Book that, that looked like a photograph as a still frame, that's when we knew, okay, there's a path here. We can succeed. And you build on those successes. But, but it's very easy to get frustrated by the failures because there are just so many of them. You have to build on the moments where you see the potential and then rally around those and, 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 and kind of pursue that path. Well, we're going to wrap. I hope everyone found that as inspirational as I did. Um, there's a quote that I read uh, from John. I'm actually going to use it in my, my talk tomorrow, where he says, I want to find the humanity in the technology. Um, and it, it, to me, it was like chilling when I read it because it spoke so clearly to how I feel about technology. And, you know, it's, I know you didn't necessarily pa pick this path, but you, you know, you could have this legacy on bringing the humanity te to technology, and really because storytelling is the most, you know, personal and human way to interact with it. I think it's, I think it's an important thing to, to underscore because so, so much of the time people are reading about technologies or learning about new things, and, and it's almost like they're at a racetrack trying to figure out which horse is going to win or not, or, oh, people aren't going to go to a theater to see that way of doing it or that way. But what you got to realize is that it's it's a one-way street. It might you don't know how the river is going to flow, but it's flowing in a direction. And if the only people who are involved with it are people who are unconcerned with the human aspect of it, that's going to shape the path. And so for people, and what's nice about this conference is that it's the overlapping of the two, because I think that everybody has an interest in both, uh, but to different. The, but the pie chart is a little different, and the team it takes all because it is a team sport. It takes all different types working together to ultimately hit that goal. That's it's the it's the it's the um, it's the collection of people with different skill sets who can interact effectively together that will ultimately break us through. And so, as storytellers, I think it's important that we get a vote in in the path. And if you don't, you're relegating it to being uh, to to going down a path that might not be good for for our culture. There's a lot of scary stuff about tech, especially when it's first breaking through. Every time I read it, the first instinct is always to recoil and to always say, ooh, that's kind of scary, or that could get Orwellian, or that could... And then you start to see, well, what's the opportunity to humanize it? How can we guide the path by creating an experience that taps into people's, um, people's desire to connect with one another? And so what's interesting is, as, as we were just even talking about uh, VR, that uh, the more people could connect with one another in VR, the more, the more comfortable people become with the technology. We realize that it's just a way for us to connect with each other more efficiently and effectively. And I think that's really the key, whether it's movie making, any kind of storytelling, when you feel connected to the person who's either making the movie and that experience has been presented to you in a way that you feel some sense of communion, or if it's something where my kid's on playing Minecraft and basically with her friend on the other end of, of the Skype and they're building this thing that I could have never dreamed of with blocks or Lego as a kid, you realize that it's really 
them wanting to connect with each other in a more uh, robust way. And, and, that, and that to me is what gives hope and, and that's, what, that's what's exciting about, about all, of, all of us coming together at a conference like this. Everyone, John Favreau, thank you.